As I said, we're closing the Belief series, and uh, I had the opportunity to choose from about four topics uh, as to how to close this series, and I chose the topic of stewardship on purpose. Uh, Number one, it's not an easy topic, uh, but nevertheless, it's a topic that the Bible speaks a lot about, and it's been a good while since we've talked uh, or devoted a whole message to the subject of stewardship. And so uh, I, I chose this topic because I think it's always good for all of us to be reminded about what it is to be a good steward for the Lord. And so uh, we're going to be reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 5 in just a moment. But I want to challenge you to be uh, a generous giver. Uh, I love to give. Uh, I know that there are many here today that love to give. As a matter of fact, I want to start by saying this is a very, very giving church, a very, very generous church. And I'll be talking more about that in just a little bit. But I want to commend this congregation. Two weeks ago, Pastor Dean uh, preached his trial sermon, and it basically was, I love the Word of God. Last week, we talked about I love the church, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. And today, we want to talk about being people who love the Lord and we love to give. Now, why? Why do we love to give? Because we have been given much. To whom much is given, much is required. That's what the Bible teaches us. And I'm thankful for that today because we have been given much. I've been teaching a class on Wednesday evening uh, on the book of Hebrews. And just this last Wednesday evening, we were talking about what it is to appreciate what we have in Jesus Christ. Because I think sometimes the temptation for those of us who have been believers a long time is to kind of settle into a routine, uh, kind of get into a rut, if you please. And uh, we don't think about sometimes all the blessings that we have because we are children of God. But you know, we sing the song Amazing Grace. Philip Yancey has written a a book entitled, What's So Amazing About Grace? Well, let me tell you something. If, If you don't understand what's so amazing about grace, you need to read the book. Because Philip Yancey goes into great detail to remind us what's so amazing about grace. God's grace is amazing, and I know all of us agree with that. And I know when we sing the old hymn, Amazing Grace, we just love that song because of the message that it has. But you know, the more we think about what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ, the more we will want to serve Him, the more we will want to love Him. And I hope that none of us will ever get into that rut where we just kind of take what we have in Christ for granted. And so I want to remind you to just take a step back, and I want you to think about God's amazing grace. I want you to think about what God has done for you. For God so loved you and me that He gave, He gave, He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, We've memorized that verse, John 3, 16. But we need to understand that God's amazing grace prompted him to give and to give and to give some more. And he's continuing to give to you and me. And each and every day, we receive good gifts from our Heavenly Father. Just about the time when you've received, you think you've received all the good gifts that God has to give, you find that there's more because he just gives more and more and more and more. And when we understand our great need and we understand that he came to fulfill that need to meet our need, that's what grace is. Grace is giving us what we need instead of what we deserve. And I'm so thankful that day by day by day, I can bask in the grace of God and continually receive from him what I need instead of what I deserve because I am a sinner saved by grace. And the more I understand how much I need God's grace, the more I appreciate God's good gifts to me. And so, 
I recognize how much God has given me, and therefore that should motivate me to want to give not only back to him, but back to other people. We need to be generous givers, and this church is a generous giver. You know, there have been times, if you like me, when you wondered how in the world is God going to sustain this ministry? But he has, and he continues to sustain this ministry. And how? By his amazing grace. How? By working through his people, people just like you, people just like me, because God works through us to do the greatest work in the world, and that's kingdom work. And that's another thing that we need to appreciate. We are a part of a kingdom. Jesus Christ is the king, and this kingdom will have no end. This world and everything in it one day will melt, dissolve, and vanish away. But when we've invested in eternal matters, in eternal things, the things of God, we can know that our investment is going to last forever. Because one day God's going to collect all of us who have ever been his children together, and he's going to usher us into the eternal place that he's prepared for his children, and we're going to live with him and rule and reign with him forever and ever and ever and ever. And at that point, and hopefully way before then, but at that point, we're going to realize how great God's grace really is. We're going to realize that whatever it is that we invested in the eternal things that God has promised, we're going to be grateful that we made that investment. Because there are so many things that we're tempted to invest in in this life that really are not very good investments. They're really not. And uh, we just need to trust the Lord to give us the wisdom to invest in things that will have eternal significance because God is good and His grace is amazing. And so as we talk about stewardship this morning, please understand you don't own anything, and I don't either. Everything that we have is on loan from God. Everything. He created you. He created me. He's our creator. And so we owe our lives to him. Everything he gives us belong to him. And we are simply stewards. That simply means that we're managers. We are managers of what God has given to us. And one day when we leave this world, and if Jesus doesn't return first. All of us someday are going to leave this world. Are we going to take what we have with us? No. We're going to leave it behind, and someone else is going to pick it up, and hopefully they'll be a good steward of what we've left behind. But the thing of it is, everything that we are, everything that we have belongs to God, and He's asked us to be a good manager of what He has entrusted to our care. Now, there are a lot of people, even church people, that think, if I give to God my tithe, well, then I can do whatever I want to with the rest. May I just offer this suggestion? God wants us to be good stewards of everything that we have and not just a portion of it. And when we try to glorify God through everything that we have, well, then God is glorified by our lives. And that's really the challenge. And that's what good stewardship is, understanding that we own nothing, God owns everything, and he's asked us to be managers. And when we manage what he has given us well, well, then he is glorified, his kingdom is blessed, and his kingdom moves forward to touch this world because if there's anything this world needs, it's Jesus Christ. And we have the opportunity to help sustain the work of his kingdom by giving to the Lord. And when we do, he is glorified. Let's turn to our text then from 2 Corinthians 9, starting with verse 5. And as we go through this, I'm going to pause and give you a little explanation about the verses that we're reading, kind of like an expository sermon. And then I'm going to give you some reasons why believers give to the church. And you'll be able to identify to many of these, I'm sure. So let's read together 2 Corinthians 9, verse 5. And Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and he says, Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds 
will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. Now that reminds me of the verse that says you reap what you sow. You see, if we sow generously, we're going to reap generously. If we sow sparingly, we're going to reap sparingly. And so Paul is reminding the believers at Corinth, plant generously. Because when you plant generously, you're going to reap a great, great harvest. Verse 7, you must each make up your own mind as to how much you should give. Now, to me, this is saying we've got to be decisive about what we give. It's not something we just reach into our pocket and give our loose change or open our billfold or our purse and just pull out some money and throw it in the offering basket. It's deciding what we should properly give to the Lord. And so it's something we pray about. It's something that we plan on. And so we're prepared to give. We've decided what it is we're going to give. And that's what Paul challenges these believers with. And so make up your mind as to what you're going to give. Don't give reluctantly. Don't give in response to pressure. For God loves the person who gives cheerfully. This morning, I'm not teaching this message to twist your arm. I'm not preaching this sermon in order to lay on you a guilt trip, because I think most of you are generous givers already. Doesn't mean we don't need to hear this. I think we all need to be reminded of these truths. But what I am preaching this message for is so that we can be responsible to the whole counsel of God. And so he says, check your attitude. What attitude do you have about giving? Are you reluctant? Do you feel that, feel that it's a duty instead of a privilege? Check your attitude because we need to give cheerfully. We need to give cheerfully. Verse 8, and God will generously provide all your need. You see, when you don't give out of reluctance or you don't give out of duty, you're giving out of love and you're cheerful about it. You have a healthy attitude about your giving. And God says, I will provide all of your needs. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Isn't that great news? That's God's blessing for generous people. Verse 9, as the scriptures say, godly people give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will never be forgotten. Part of the ministry that we have as believers is to share what we have with the poor. Now, just one of many examples of how this church is a generous church is displayed every time we come to the holidays. Out in the foyer this morning, there's a Christmas tree. It's a little thing, but on there's a lot of different tags, and you can take tags off of that tree, and you can give to the effort that we're organizing to give generously to people in need during the coming holidays. And so you can share in that ministry. Out in the foyer also this morning, Samaritan's Purse, and we do this every year, Operation Christmas Child. And so there are boxes out there that you can take, and you can fill those boxes with suggested items or anything that you would like. It really helps to follow the directions because they don't want any perishables in the box. But by doing that, you're going to bless some young person someplace in a distant place around the globe that's going to be blessed at Christmas time by the generosity of your giving. And that's going to be a wonderful thing. Now, those boxes are due by next Sunday. And so be sure to pick it up today and bring it back next Sunday and, and see how many boxes we can have to give. And every year, we're very generous and giving lots of boxes to those in need. And I'm thankful for that. But those are just a couple of examples of how this church takes on these different opportunities to give and to touch the lives of those that are less fortunate. And this is what it's talking about here. You're giving to meet the needs of the poor, and your good deeds will never be forgotten. Verse 10, for God is the one who gives seed to the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will give you many opportunities to do good, and he will produce a great harvest of generosity in you. 
Now, I want you to notice in these verses how God is the one being emphasized here. God is the one who gives to the farmer and then bread to eat. You see, God gives, God gives, and then we're good steward of what God gives. And as a result, others are blessed by God through our giving. He says, in the same way, God will give you many opportunities to do good. God will give you and me many opportunities to do good. And then it says, and God will produce a great harvest of generosity in you. And so God is giving, God is giving, God is giving. He's using our giving to touch the lives of others and to do his work. It all initiates with God. Why? Because God is the greatest giver who has given us the greatest gift. And he gives us good gifts every day. And it's up to us to manage those gifts. Verse 11, yes, you will be enriched, he says, so that you can give even more generously. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will break out in thanksgiving to God. So two good things happen, he says. The needs of the Christians in Jerusalem will be met. There was a famine taking place in Judea. And the churches in the known world at that time were taking up offerings to send back to the saints in Jerusalem so that their needs could be met during a very difficult time. So Paul is saying the needs of the Christians in Jerusalem will be met, and that's what happens when we meet the needs of other Christians around the world, whether it be through our mission effort or through our benevolence programs, through so many ministries of the church, and they will joyfully express their thanksgiving to God. And that's what we want people to do. We want to turn people's attention to God because of our generosity. And so again, I'm grateful for this church and for the generosity of this church. Now, let me just give you one one little statistic that shows you how generous this church is. The per capita giving here at Fairfield Christian Church is $52 per week per person. $52 per week per person. The national average is 33. You see how much generosity exists in this fellowship? Because God is working here through the lives of believers, not just to sustain this ministry, but to allow this ministry to touch the lives of many, many people in our community, as well as people in distant places. And it's all because of God's call upon this place. God's call upon you and your response to God's call. Now, let me be clear. Giving is not about everyone giving the same amount. I might say the giving is $52 per capita per week, and you might say, I don't give nearly that much. Well, maybe you can't give nearly that much, and maybe someone can give much more than that. You see, it's not about equal giving. It's about equal sacrifice. You see, it's about loving God together and allowing God to take the love that we have for Him and the love of others around us, the love that they have for Him, and thus unifying in this great partnership and this great ministry to accomplish what needs to be done. You give as God has blessed you. And whatever the amount is, that's not the significant part. The significant part is, are we generous with what we have? Are we giving because we love the Lord? In the Bible, we have two examples of giving. There's giving by the law that demands that you give so much, or there's giving by love that says you just give according to how much you love the Lord. Now, a a way to illustrate this, I think, is we're coming upon the Christmas season, and I know a few people that just go bonkers over Christmas. I mean, they just love, love, love Christmas. And they go out and they shop and they shop and they shop and they're going to give all their loved ones gifts and gifts and gifts and gifts because they love the spirit of Christmas. They love to give. I think that's wonderful. And that's the way we ought to feel about the Lord Jesus Christ. He has given to us and Christmas ought to be all about Jesus anyway. And I'm not just talking about the holidays. I'm talking about every day. We ought to love to give. 
And when we love to give, we're going to use the resources that God has placed at our disposal, and we're going to be good stewards of those resources, and we're going to give. We're going to give to the best of our ability. And I'm thankful that we have that opportunity. So it's not about law. It's not about duty. It's about love. And it's about sharing what we have. That's the way God would have it be. And so the goal of this teaching this morning is to not ask more from those who are generous, sacrificial givers, those who tithe and even, even go far above the tithe. The challenge is that all of us will just grow in our generosity. And if you're not a generous giver, that maybe you'll accept the challenge from the Lord himself to become a generous giver. Why? Because God doesn't want you to miss out on the blessing of being generous in your giving. This morning, I want to share with you these reasons why I think that believers, church members, give to the church. And so on the back of your bulletin, if you want to follow along and fill in the blanks, you'll have the seven reasons, I believe, that church members will give to the Lord's work. Number one, people give when they love Jesus and they love the church. People give when they love Jesus and love the church. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And so you see, again, it's all about love. Jesus said, where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be also. And so where is your heart? You can take your checkbook and look into the record of where you record what you're spending your money on, and you can determine what really means most to you. Because where our treasure is, that's where our heart is. And so, we need to understand the teachings of Scripture because that determines how we ought to give and if we are a generous giver. And so, people who give love Jesus and they love the church. Number two, people who give trust God and, hold on, they trust the church leadership. Now, you might say it's easy to trust God. Well, it's easy to say we trust God, but it's not always easy to trust God. I'm reminded of the widow who gave all she had. The widow's might, we all know the story. She gave all she had because she was willing to trust God after giving all she had for God to supply, for God to trust, for God to take care of her. She trusted God that much. Now, I'm not suggesting that we give everything that we have. I think we surrender it to the Lord, but I don't know that God is asking you to give everything that you have, but he is asking you to be generous. And he is telling us, all of us, that if we're generous with what we have, he will meet our needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. And so we trust God. We know that we cannot outgive God and that he'll take care of us. Now, there's this matter of trusting the church leadership. You know what? Over the years, Fairfield Christian Church has been challenged in a lot of different ways. And our leadership has been faced with a lot of difficult challenges. And I think by and large, they have done an excellent job. And I am so thankful for our leadership. I'm mainly talking about our elders. I'm thankful that there are men of faith, they are men of prayer, and they are men that make decisions that they believe it will glorify God and is in the best interest of the church. And so I'm thankful that I can trust them. I'm thankful for the staff that I have the privilege of working with here. It's a blessing to work with our staff and to know that they all love the Lord and they all come surrendered and ready to give their efforts to move the ministry of this church forward. And I'm thankful for their sacrificial service. And so people give when they're able to trust God and able to tr trust the leadership. And I'm thankful that I, and you'll have to speak for yourself, can trust the leadership of the church here because God is working through them to do a wonderful work in this place. Number three, people give when they catch the vision and not just see the need. It's one thing to give to a need. It's another thing to see what a vision is. The Bible says where there is no vision, the people perish. 
And so God has a vision for this ministry. I know Pastor Dean in coming here, he has a vision for this ministry. And I don't want to speak for Pastor Dean, but I have heard him say, we're going to work together to develop healthy Christians, healthy disciples, and in turn, that will develop a healthy church. And when you have healthy Christians together in a healthy church, everything else will be healthy. And so that's the vision, at least part of the vision I know he has for this place. And that's exciting. And I believe that you want to be a healthy believer. I want to be a healthy believer. And we're moving toward that. And as we all unite together in unity, loving God and loving one another for that mission, for that goal, well, then God's going to bless it. And this place is going to prosper. We need to emphasize the life, lives that have been changed because of this ministry and the lives that are going to be changed because of this ministry. Souls that will be saved, marriages that will be rescued, broken people who will be brought back together, the people who will break addictions, the needy that will be helped, all because of this ministry and your faithfulness by being generous givers. That's why we need to be faithful to the Lord and love to give. That vision creates excitement and a desire to give. Number four, people give to experience the joy of generosity. Again, I go back to my illustration about Christmas. Why do people give good gifts during the Christmas time? Well, they like to see the expressions on the children's face, on their loved one's faces because of their gift to them. I'm sure they like to see that expression of being a receiver of the good gifts that they are providing. But you know what? There is joy in giving. All of us enjoy to give to others, and it just creates within us a good feeling. And the same thing should be true concerning our gifts to God. We have joy in our hearts because we're able to give to Him. And I know that God gives to us, and it brings Him great joy to give to us through His amazing grace. And so... We give because we are joyful or cheerful givers. Number five, people give when they are inspired by an example. I think most of us have appreciated over the last few weeks, and it hasn't always been in this service, but we've had several people give wonderful testimonies about what God is doing in the lives of people who have had needs. We've had It seems like several people here recently have undergone critical, serious surgeries, and they have recovered, sometimes miraculously, and they have given their testimony. In the first service this morning, Trish Gormley gave her testimony how grateful she is for God's grace to bring her to a place of recovery where she is. Now, she still has a ways to go, but she's thankful for what God has done, and she's also thankful to be a part of a fellowship like this who has prayed faithful, faithfully for her over the last few weeks that have, has brought her to this point. Jean Barr was in the service a couple of weeks ago and telling about his experience. He was involved in a serious accident, and rightfully Under normal circumstances, he may not have been able to recover and walk again. But Gene is doing very well, and he was at the altar again this morning, thanking God for his amazing grace and for his progress in recovery. And so it goes on and on and on. That could almost be a weekly event here at Fairfield as we see God moving in the lives of people, not just about physical healing, but also about emotional healing, spiritual healing, the healing of marriages, the healing of families. I mean, God is at work. God is doing great things. And it's all because God is good and he's gracious to us. And so when you hear those testimonies, you see people that are praising God for his goodness. Doesn't that inspire you? It inspires me. I'm thankful that they will testify to the goodness of God in their life And I've heard so many people testify about when they're generous in their giving, God not only meets their needs, but exceeds their greatest expectations because God is faithful. You cannot outgive God. Number six, people who give are often people who are involved in the church. Surveys have been taken, and it's a proven fact that when people get involved in ministry, 
they really get involved in investing not only their time, but also their talents and their treasures in ministry. And so involved people are happy people. There's a number of people that come in, they participate in the worship, and they leave, and that's great. We're glad that everyone's here. But so many times people decide to get involved in a small group, they get involved in an ABF, they get involved in a ministry team of some kind, and they're just involved because there are many opportunities here to get involved in a small way or in a big way. But when people are involved and they see the inner workings of the church and what goes on here in so many different areas of ministry, they are inspired to give, to support this because they see what's being done and they want to be a part of it and give generously to it. People told, uh, Paul told the Philippian Christians, I thank God because of your partnership in the gospel. There's hardly a week that goes by that I'm not praying with somebody and thanking God for their partnership in this ministry because we've got so many people here that are faithful to be a partner in this ministry. We are yoked together in a fellowship of believers that is doing the work of God, and may God be glorified and praised because of it. And if it wasn't for this partnership that we have, well, then the work of the church here would not be nearly as effective as what it is. And so people that are involved are cheerful givers and generous givers. Finally, people give when they are asked to give. The Bible repeatedly talks about, ask and you will receive, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened unto you. The book of James says, you have not because you ask not. And I would scarcely say that most of us here ask God to continue to bless us, ask God to continue to take care of us, not only ourselves, but the needs of many people that we know of, the needs within our family, the needs within our church family, the needs within our neighborhoods. We ask God, and God wants us to come, and He wants us to ask, and He wants us to trust Him to meet those needs. And so, I would be remiss if I didn't preach the whole counsel of God and remind us from time to time that the Bible wants us to be good stewards. The Bible wants us to have the proper perspective about that which we possess and how we are to be good managers of what has been given to us. I want to close with a, a verse out of Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. It's always been kind of one of my favorites. It simply says, if you give, you will receive. If you give, you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full measure. In other words, you can't outgive God. It'll be pressed down, shaken together to make room for more. And running over. Whatever measure you use in giving, large or small, it will be used to measure what is given back to you. And so, it's so, it's so apparent what the Bible is teaching about the blessing of God that comes to those who love to give, who love to hear what the Bible teaches and make application of it. And through the years of ministry, I don't know that I've ever heard anyone come and say, you know what, I want my money back. You stood up there and you preached that if I give, God would meet my needs. And I have. I've preached that for over 40 years now in ministry. And I don't recall anyone ever coming and saying, Preacher, you lied to me. I want my money back. Because I believe that anyone who honestly, seriously commits themselves to God commits themselves to being a good steward, not only of money, but their time and their talents. They will be a good steward to God. I don't know that anyone has ever said to me, I'm sorry I did that. I'm sorry I made that commitment. God didn't uphold his end of the deal because you know God is a promise keeper. He makes these promises. They're not empty words. He will fulfill his promise every time. All you have to do is obey Him, love Him, serve Him, and watch Him work. 
Would you pray with me, please? Thank you, Lord, for this time together. Thank you for the teaching of your word concerning stewardship, even concerning giving. And I pray that everyone in this room today would be a person who loves to give. They would love to give to you. They would love to give to their spouse. They would love to give to their children, to their grandchildren. They would just love to give even as you provide. And so, God, we trust you for your provision because we know that you're faithful and that you promised to meet our needs, especially when we're generous givers. So, Lord, just bless this time of decision. If there's someone here that needs to become a generous giver, I pray that you would motivate them, our Father, to try your plan and to know that you're faithful and to watch what you will do. If there's someone here, our Father, that needs prayer, help them to know that we would like to pray with them and for them. If there's someone here today that needs Jesus, I pray, God, that today would be their day of decision to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So bless this decision time. We commit it to you, and we pray that your Holy Spirit would move among us to accomplish what needs to be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.